Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, we're there in uh, Acts chapter number 19. Thank you. I sent you another text. Let me make sure you see that, please. Acts chapter 19, and uh, we are, uh, of course, ending our Red Hot Preaching Conference today. And I appreciate you being here <clears throat> and uh, being here for the, for the last day uh, and the last, uh, last speaker. There in Acts 19, if you look at verse number 1, the Bible says this, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, and it goes on to the story. I want you to notice that we are jumping into one of Paul's missionary journeys. And Paul, of course, would go into these cities, and he would try to do missions work and evangelistic work. And here we see him coming to the city of Ephesus. And, of course, we know that he ended up establishing a church in Ephesus. We've got the epistle uh, written to the Ephesians, where it's Paul giving instruction to the church in Ephesus. And I want you to notice, there's a lot of just kind of stories that are found in this chapter, a very interesting chapter, but I want you to notice how the chapter ends. If you go down to verse number 35, the Bible says this, And when the town clerk had appeased the people, when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. And by the way, that's considered one of the, uh, one of the great ancient landmarks of, of the world. Verse 36, Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess, Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. Now here we have the town clerk, and he's literally trying to disperse a group that is gathered together because there's been a huge protest against the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Notice verse 40. For we are in danger to be called in question of this day's uproar. And I want you to notice that word uproar there. He says, we are in question for this day's uproar. uproar. There being no cause whereby we may give an account for this concourse. And that word means this gathering or this assembly. Look at verse 41. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Here's what I like about Acts chapter 19 is that when Acts 19 begins in verse 1, we have the apostle Paul entering into the city of Ephesus. And when Acts 19 ends at the end of the chapter, we have the whole city in an uproar. We have the whole city in chaos. We have the whole city uh, just uh, persecuting him and persecuting his followers. And here's what you need to understand. This idea of, of, of Paul or New Testament Christians or first century Christians causing an uproar is a theme that we find through the New Testament. I'll show you a couple of verses in the book of Acts. If you can go back uh, uh, to actually go to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, you're there in Acts 19, go to Acts 21, and of course, we, you remember that the Lord Jesus Christ caused a bunch of uproars, and there was one final uproar that led, in, uh, led to his crucifixion, where the people, the mob turned on him, and they uh, had him crucified, and they uh, had the uh, city officials, the Roman officials, put him to death. Notice Acts 21 and verse 30, the Bible says this, and I want you to just notice these words. And all the city was moved. Acts chapter 21, verse 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band. Notice what it says, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Here we have another example where Paul and his ministry and his preaching and his presence had caused an uproar. And here we have the captain of the band, a Roman uh, soldier, coming and rescuing him from this mob, from this uproar. Go to Acts chapter 17. Look at verse number 4. And again, we could look at a lot of passages. I'll just show you a couple. Acts chapter 17, look at verse 4. Acts chapter 17 and verse 4, the Bible says this, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. I love that wording. 
He, he goes in there and he's starting getting people saved. You say, how many people saved? A great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Look at verse 5. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain loot fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, don't miss these words, and sat all the city on an uproar. I want you to notice that when you study the book of Acts, and when you study New Testament, first century Christianity, they did not have this attitude that we need to just go along to get along. We need to just exist and try to not cause problems and try to not cause issues and try to not get any attention. In fact, the opposite was true. Everywhere Jesus went, everywhere Paul went, everywhere New Testament Christians went, they were causing an uproar in the cities that they were ministering in. Look at verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying. Notice what they said. We take this as a compliment. We use this verse as a compliment of New Testament Christianity. But this is not how the verse was given. This, these, word, uh, these words were not given as a compliment to the Apostle Paul and his ministry. They are saying, these are people in an uproar. These are people at a protest. Test. These are people that are upset and they're crying. These that have turned the world upside down Amen. are come hither also. Amen. See, they would look at these New Testament Christians and say, these people are troublemakers. These people are trying to shake things up. These people are causing an uproar. These people are trying to cause problems. The choir this morning sang about turning the tide. And you know what we need in America? We need to turn the tide. You say, how are you going to do that? Well, you know what? I believe, and it is my position, it is my belief, and we can see it from the Word of God, that we need New Testament Christianity to get back to causing some uproars. You say, what do you mean by that? I, I'm saying we need to cause a ruckus. I'm saying we need to, st we need to challenge the status quo. I, I, I'm saying we need to disturb the balance a little bit. I'm saying, we, I, I, don't, I don't know how else to, I, I'm trying to think of as many, you know, I wrote down some, some analogies here. We need to make a stink. We need to rock the boat. We need to upset the uh, apple cart. We need to stir things up. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. New Testament Christianity would come into a city. Paul would walk into a city. And he'd walk out of that city after the city was made an uproar. After the city uh, was made to protest. After the city. He went in places and he just kind of rocked the boat a little bit. Amen. And the question today is why do we, as New Testament believers, believe, or maybe we should answer this question, how can we, as New Testament believers, rock the boat, cause a ruckus, cause an uproar in our cities today? And here, please understand this. There's a right and a wrong way to do this. There are some churches out there that they cause all sorts of uproars. But they do them in ways that are not biblical and in ways that are not scriptural. Look, I'm not talking about going and protesting somebody's funeral. Uh, well, well, are, are you for the military industrial complex? I, I'm not for the military industrial complex. I just don't. I don't ever see the Apostle Paul protesting anything. I don't ever see the Apostle Paul walking into somebody's funeral and talking about uh, how they ought to, ought, to, ought to protest that, that funeral. I'm not talking about walking into other religious uh, buildings and, and having some sort of a protest or whatever. But we will find and we do find that in the Bible, in the Bible we find this pattern of the Apostle Paul, how he biblically and how he scripturally caused an uproar. I'm, I'm preaching this morning on the subject of causing an uproar. I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul did. You go back to Acts chapter 19. That's our text for this morning. Acts chapter 19. I see in this chapter three steps that the Apostle Paul took to cause an uproar. And I'd encourage you to write these down on the back of your course of the week. There's a place for you to write some notes down. Maybe you can write these down. And you say, why would you preach this sermon? Well, number one, just to, just to remind our church, Verity Baptist Church, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. But you know, I'm also hoping that we can influence some other churches. There, there, there are some Baptists who are watching online right now, and they agree with us, and they believe what we believe, and they like this preaching, but they're just in the closet. 
they're not really sure what they should be doing. I'm trying to give them an instructional sermon this morning, what it is that they need to do. We've got some young men sitting in this auditorium right now that are hoping that one day they'll be able to be ordained and go into the ministry and they'll be able to be, uh, uh, go into the city and, and, and start a church there. And I want to give those young men just some instruction, some steps as to what it is that they should be accomplishing today. You're, we're talking about causing an uproar. You say, how do we do it? Well, number one, Causing an uproar will require saturating our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Causing an uproar begins with soul winning, and it begins with mass evangelism. It begins with saturating our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love this theme that's also found in the book of Acts of the Apostle Paul. You say, what did he do in Ephesus? What did he do in Ephesus that ended with an uproar, that ended with a protest, that ended with these problems? Notice verse number 8. I'd like you to notice these things. We're talking about saturating our city, saturating our community with the gospel of Christ. You say, how do we do that? Well, first of all, he was confrontational with the gospel. Notice verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and, notice these words, spake boldly. Say, so how do you know you're filled with the Spirit of God? When you speak boldly. Amen. You say, well, how can we cause an uproar in our city? How can we cause an, uh, cause an uproar in Sacramento? How can we cause an uproar back in the town that I came from? Hey, you ought to have a goal of saturating your community and your city with the gospel of Christ. You say, how do I do that? You do it through confrontational soul winning. Amen. You do it by taking it to them. You say, when you say confrontational, what do you mean? We don't need, con we, we're, I'm not talking about contentious. I'm not talking about being mean and ugly and angry out there when we're preaching the gospel. You say, what do you mean by confrontational? I mean, we're on the offense. We're taking it to them. I'm pretty sure I read these words somewhere in the New Testament. Go. Go ye therefore. Go preach the gospel. Hey, we're supposed to go. We're supposed to confront them. He went into the synagogue. And what did he do? He spake boldly. That's why the Apostle Paul would pray that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel of Christ. Notice verse 9. But when the divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way uh, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated in the, uh, 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 the, the disciples, disputing daily, notice, in the school of one Tyrannus. I want you to notice, Paul preached the gospel. Paul preached the gospel wherever they'd let him preach the gospel. He went everywhere. He went anywhere and everywhere. Why? Because he was on the offense. Why? Because he had confrontational soul winning. But I want you to notice, not only was he confrontational with the gospel, he also contended for the gospel. Notice verse 8 again. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. Notice these words. Disputing. Disputing. What does that mean? That means to refute and to argue against. Disputing. And persuading, what does persuade mean? To convince or to win over. He went out disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Notice verse 9. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples. Notice these words. Disputing daily. I love that. Disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Doesn't the Bible say, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We've been called to earnestly contend. Again, I'm not talking about being contentious, but I'm talking about be, uh, contending for the faith, defending for the faith. We ought to be kind when we're out soul winning and we're talking to, to, to lost people. Look, when we knock on someone's door, we are uninvited guests. I don't believe in going out there and being ugly and being nasty and, and being rude. But look, it is our job to confront them and it is our job to contend with them in regards to the gospel. And we can do that in a kind way. I'm not talking about spending hours with a heretic. The Bible says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. I'm not talking about getting into some egotistical debate. But if you can talk to someone and you can help somebody and you can, uh, and you can dispute and you can persuade somebody, you got to take the time to do it. Earlier this week, I was out soul winning with, uh, I think it was Brother Rob from Australia. We we're out soul winning. We knocked on a door of a, of, of a lady. She's a, a Russian lady. And she, she goes to one of these Russian uh, churches here in Sacramento and preaches a, a false gospel. And, and we were talking. We, we had a long conversation. It was a pleasant conversation. It wasn't heated or angry in any way. But we were definitely disputing. And, and I was attempting to persuade. 
And I was trying to preach to her and explain to her that the gospel and salvation is not of works. You don't have to earn it. You have to repent of your sin. And she, you know, I told her, the Bible says, Jesus said, you must be born again. I tried to use that illustration and explain to her. Salvation is like a birth, and you get born into the family of God. And once you're born, you don't, you don't get unborn. You don't lose that. I was trying to explain to her, you know, the way you live your life does not affect whether you're born into the family of God. Now, it may affect whether you get a spiritual spanking. You know, and she's giving me her illustration. She's saying, she, she told me, well, salvation is like riding a motorcycle. And uh, if you ride a motorcycle without a helmet, and I'm like, I'm not even sure what you're talking about. <laughs> she's like, you could ride the motorcycle and do good things with it, but if you don't have a helmet and you fall, you'll die. And I'm like, okay. And she said, salvation is salvation like, salvation's like, she said, salvation is like taking, uh, uh, enrolling for college. You can enroll for classes, but if you never show up to the class, you won't get, you won't get uh, your diploma. And I looked at it, I said, listen, lady, uh, that, that's nice and that's good, but listen, nowhere in the Bible does it say that salvation is like enrolling into a college program. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that salvation is like riding a motorcycle without a helmet. But the Bible tells us that salvation is a new birth. The Bible tells us that you get bored. And you say, what were you doing? We were disputing, and we were persuading, and we were attempting to get her saved. You say, why would you do that? Because that's how you cause an uproar. That's how you make an impact. I don't know about you, but I want, I, I want to make sure that my life has made an impact for the cause of Christ. Why don't you notice that he confronted them with the gospel, and he contented with them uh, for the gospel. But notice, thirdly, he continued in the gospel. Acts 19 and verse 8. Notice what the Bible says. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly. Notice, for the space of three months. For the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued, notice, by the space of two years. Paul wasn't the guy that showed up to go soul winning because he was at the Red Hot Preaching Conference. Paul, Paul continued in the gospel. And, and he continued when it was fruitful. He continued when it was not fruitful. He was in it for the long run. You say, uh, is it going to take three months to get this area done? Then he'll take three months. Is it going to take two years to get this area done? Then he'll take two years. He confronted them, and he contended with them, and he continued. Amen. He was faithful. I want you to notice, fourthly, and I'll use this word, and I hope you don't misunderstand it, but he also canvassed with the gospel. Now, today that word is misused, and usually when you talk about churches canvassing, they're talking about door hangers and, and, and putting flyers on doors, and obviously we're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about being confrontational with the gospel. You say, but well, what do you mean by canvassing? We mean this. We're going to knock every door in Sacramento, California. We're, we're going to make sure that this entire city and the cities around get an opportunity, and they are warned. We can't win them all, but we can warn them all. We got a map, and we're going to highlight it. We, we're going to print maps, and we're going to give them to you, and we're going we're gonna to systematically and structured go through the city and preach the gospel and saturate this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because that's what the Apostle Paul did. Notice verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years. I love these words. What to God this could be said of Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Notice verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Jerusalem. And fear fell on them, then the name of the Lord was magnified. Look at verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Look at verse 26. Moreover, ye see and hear. This is uh, Paul's enemy speaking about him. This is what they're saying about Paul. They said, moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. You say, Pastor Jimenez, how do you cause an uproar? It all begins with soul winning. It all begins with soul winning. Some of you became aware of our church and started following our church and started, uh, and started rooting for our church back when we had a little uproar here in Sacramento. Back in 2016, and, and I praise God for it, and I thank the Lord for it, but let me tell you something. Before the media caught on, this church was preaching all that and going soul winning and doing all those things for years and years and years and years and years. We were faithfully knocking doors. We were printing maps. We were going through. You say, why? Because we want it to be said that Verity Baptist Church hath persuaded and turned away much people. 
from Catholicism, much people from Mormonism, much people from Jehovah's Witnessism, much people from Hinduism, from, from Islam. You say, why? Because we're trying to cause an uproar. We're, we're, we're not trying to just maintain the status quo. We're trying to shake things up a little bit. You say, how do you do that? You do that through saturating this community. And by the way, this is a theme in the New Testament. Go to Acts 5, 28. Acts chapter 5, verse 28. Acts chapter 5, verse 28. Notice what the Bible says. This is in Jerusalem, not Ephesus. Acts 5, 28. This is, again, the enemies of the church in Jerusalem. Notice what they said. Saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, notice what they said. The enemy said to the church in Jerusalem, Ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You say, Pastor Jimenez, what is it that you're trying to accomplish in Sacramento, California? I'm trying to fill Sacramento with our doctrine. Amen. And by the way, it's not just the gospel. That's where we start. You say, well, well, yeah, I mean, you guys can preach uh, uh, the gospel all day one, but why, why do you got to preach on the homos? Because we're trying to fill Jerusalem with the doctrine. Because we're trying to let them know everything the Bible says, everything the Bible teaches, everything. Look, we're trying to preach the whole counsel of God. Amen. Notice Acts chapter 9, verse 42. Acts chapter 9 and verse 42. Acts chapter 9 and verse 42. This is after Peter resurrected Tabitha. Acts 9, 42, the Bible says this, And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Notice Acts chapter 10 and verse 37. Acts 10, 37 says this, The word I say ye know, notice what it says, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Go to Acts chapter number 13 and verse 44. Acts chapter number 13 and verse 44. The Bible says, And the next Sabbath day came almost. Acts chapter 13, verse 44. And the next Sabbath day, I'm showing you New Testament Christianity, first century Christianity. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Look at verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all, that, all the region. You know, in the book of Acts, they had this idea that you need, to, you need to go big or go home. Would to God, Verity Baptist Church, we get a vision to go big in this area. To just saturate this city and saturate this community with the gospel and the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what to God, some of you young men would get a fire burning in you and say, I'm going to go take over a city for Christ. Amen. I'm going to go find me a little storefront. Let them mock the storefront. Let them mock the ghetto buildings. Let them mock what look. It's not about the buildings. You get, you get a cheap map and you get a highlighter and you start knocking the doors in that city and conquer and take conquest and, and conquer that city for Christ. Amen. You say, how do you start it? How do you, how do you uh, cause an uproar? It begins by saturating, saturating with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why, you say, why would you send out over 350 soul winners yesterday to, to preach the gospel? Because we're, we're trying to upset the apple cart a little bit. Why, why would you pastor a church and, and you're trying to influence your church people, 90 to 100 of them every week, to be out in the community of Sacramento and knocking doors and preaching the gospel? Because we're trying to ca uh, cause a ruckus a little bit. And look, and I'm, I'm, for, I'm, for, I'm for preaching the gospel anywhere that allows us to preach it. I believe soul winning and door to door and, and two by two, that's the method given in scripture. And I don't think we should replace that, but I'll add anything to that. You know, we, this summer we had our soul winners in the county fair. We had our soul winners in the state fair. You know, if, 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 someone, if someone will sneak us into the fair, hey, I'll preach the gospel. We'll preach the gospel there. Say, why, why do you have these YouTube channels and these live streams? Why, why is it you're just constantly, they keep shutting you down and you keep starting up new ones? Why? Because we're just trying to get the word out. Yeah. By any way, by any means. Say, why do you pay till you put your preaching on, on that, uh, on that uh, public access channel here in Sacramento? Uh, I don't know, because it reaches 3 million people in Northern California. Amen. And by the way, let me just take a moment to give you a quick, uh, uh, you know, commercial. You can watch us at 7 p.m. on Tuesdays on Comcast 20, AT&T 14, and Consolidated 19. 
You say, oh, do you have to, do you have to remove all the, all the heavy doctrine, all the contrary? We don't remove nothing. Amen. You say, well, what if they shut you down? We'll just keep preaching God's word till they shut us down. So far, it seems like it's going, it's going great. Don't call anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody. You say, you say why, why do you guys spend money to send that psychopath reprobate CBD to every person that moves into uh, Sacramento, California? Because we're just trying to saturate this city with the gospel. Amen. I'm excited. Once we, we're, we're done, done with this Red Hop Region Conference, we're we're going to take a little break and, 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 and rest a little bit. But this fall, we're looking to starting a prison ministry. And we're going to try to get into as many prisons as possible. You say, why? To reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This, is, this uh, fall, we're going to get some uh, ladies together and some, some, some guys have got some time. And we're going to go and, and into the public schools here in, in Sacramento. Not, not into the schools, but we're going to stand outside the schools and talk to these kids as they're coming out of school and, and try to get them saved. You say, why would you do that? Because we're trying to saturate this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where it begins. That where, that's where it starts. You say, how do you cause an uproar? Causing an uproar will require saturating our city with the gospel. But it's more than that. It's more than that. That's where we start, but it's more than that. You can't get there without that, but it's more than that. Because here's the truth. Here's the truth. They don't mind. The world doesn't mind if all we do is preach the gospel and get people saved. They really don't care. The, the world doesn't, it doesn't matter to them. Now it bothers Satan. We'll see that in the text. But the world doesn't really care. You say, well, when, when does the world begin to care? How did Paul cause an uproar? Well, we saw number one, he caused an uproar by saturating his city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But number two this morning, we see that he was causing an uproar. And causing an uproar will require separation from the world and its practices. See, this is where you actually begin to cause an uproar. Because I want you to notice that Paul was not the type of soul winner who just got somebody saved and said, well, well, see you in heaven. Have a good one. Paul, the Bible tells us, he would follow up on his converts. He'd go back and confirm those that he got saved. He tried to get them in church. He tried to get them baptized. He tried to get them discipled. He tried to get them going. Doesn't the Bible say, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things? That's discipleship. Look, let's not just get them saved, let's get them baptized, and let's get them growing in the Lord. Let's get them learning. Let's get them becoming di disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what that's going to require. What that's going to require for someone to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, is sanctification and service. They're going to have to learn to live a sanctified, uh, sanctified, a separated life, and they're going to begin to serve the Lord. Notice this is what he does in Ephesus, verse 18. And many that believed came. So notice, he didn't just get them saved. They came. They came to church. They came to, uh, uh, to the services. They came and confessed and showed their deeds. They started working. They started serving. Look at verse 19. Many of them also, and this is where Paul gets into trouble, which used curious arts, brought their books together, and burned them before all men. See, worshiping Diana was, was witchcraft. By the way, worshiping idols is witchcraft. Right. Right. The Roman Catholic Church worships, worships idols. It's witchcraft. Right. They're worshiping devils. And these people got saved, and Paul said, you can't worship these idols anymore. You got, you got to get rid of this Diana thing. What do we do with our Harry Potter books? Amen. Well, let's burn them. Amen. And they brought these books... These that use curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And by the way, let me tell you something. I'm not preaching on that uh, on this subject this morning, but separation is going to cost you something. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Let me let me say something. You want to cause an uproar? Hey, teenagers, some, we got some young people here and they got to sneak out of their house to come to a church like this, right? Your parents are old IFB. You, gotta, you, you don't lie to them. Hopefully you didn't lie to them. Where, where are you going? I'm going to conference. Oh, North Valley? Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> you going to college days at Golden State? Uh-huh. I didn't know they had college days July 18th to the 24th. Yeah, it's a special thing. You, you don't find it online. 
You, know, you, you, come, you come here, hey, you want to cause a, a, a ruckus? You want to cause an uproar? Take all those stupid uh, rock and roll CDs and, and that music and all that. All that. You, you say, I've invested a lot of money into that stupid music. Delete it. Burn it. Yeah. Say, I spent good money. Hey, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Yeah. You want to uh, uh, cause an uproar? Dad? Go through your house and take all those stinking pants your wife has, and all those stinking Amen. pants your daughters have, and throw them in the trash right. and burn them. You're going to cause an uproar. Amen. Yeah, I, I'm just telling you, when you, you say, how do I cause an uproar? Start living a separated life. It'll, it'll come to you. Amen. You don't have to start any uproars. They'll, they'll come to you. Let me tell you something. Your family, uh, they, they'll cause a, you'll cause an uproar when you tell your family, we're not showing up to the family reunion if that queer uncle's there. That'll cause an uproar. <laughs> We're not showing up to the family gathering if everybody's going to get uh, drunk and get in a drunken stupor. We're not showing up to that. That'll cause an uproar. Good, hey, when, you're, uh, when, you're, uh, uh, when the grandparents of your precious children find out you're not vaccinating, that'll cause an uproar. <laughs> they find out you're pulling their, uh, your kids out of the public fool system and you're going to homeschool them, that'll cause an uproar. Amen. When your in-laws realize... That they wasted their money when they sent their precious little daughter and got a four-year education. And now you're talking about being a stay-at-home mom and loving your children and being a keeper at home because that's what God said. That'll cause an uproar. I'm, I'm just telling you, they don't care. Look, when you got saved, they thought that was weird. When you started going to church, they thought that was odd. When you went back on Sunday night, they're like, what's going on here? Wait, let me get the, You're knocking doors on people you don't, you don't. Are you Jehovah's Witness? Hey, tell your family you're moving across the country to go to a good church. That'll start an uproar. I, I'm just, you know what I'm telling you? That we cause an uproar when we saturate our city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we start an uproar when we begin to live separated lives. When we actually begin to walk with God and love the Lord and we say, no, we're not going to go there. No, we're not going to tolerate that. We're not going to tolerate fornication. You'll cause an uproar when you start telling your family, no, it's not okay for them to live together when they're not married. That'll cause an uproar. Amen. We're not going to tolerate the queers and the LGBTQ. I like how Pastor Perry put STD, AIDS movement. We're not going to put up with it. We're not going to tolerate it. We're not going to allow it. It'll cause an uproar. Amen. It'll cause an uproar when you start living a separate life. When you start burning NIVs, that'll cause an uproar. Amen. When you start burning your Harry Potter books, that'll cause an uproar. You start cleaning up your life, it'll cause an uproar. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Look, I, I'm, I'm telling you, we're, we're, try, we're trying to shake things up a little bit. The United States of America is on a rainbow-colored boat, and we got to shake that boat up. Amen. Look, I, I'm trying to take the rainbow back for God's glory. The, the rainbow was, was meant to, uh, was meant to uh, picture the judgment of God. Yep. Right. And I'm just telling you, it's time for Christians to embrace... New Testament, first century Christianity, and say, let's walk into a city and just cause problems, cause issues, not be rebellious, not rebel against God, but just cause some problems for the glory of God. Amen. Causing an uproar will require saturating our city with the gospel. Causing an uproar will require separation from the world and its practices. Number three, causing an uproar. Go back to Acts 19 if you're not there. Causing an uproar will require, causing an uproar will require suffering persecution from the enemies of Christ. I want you to notice in this passage, we see two forms of opposition. First of all, we see the spiritual opposition. Look at verse 13. And certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. We've got the wannabes here, right? The new, the new IFB that's all trendy and stupid. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, I love this. 
The evil spirit answered and said, here you got some wannabes trying to cast out a devil, and the evil spirit talks to them, and he says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Let me tell you something. When you start preaching the gospel and it's conquering a whole city with the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ, when you start growing a church and discipling some people and they start separating and they start living for the Lord, the devil's going to take notice. You don't, think, you don't think the devils, there's been devils at the Red Hot Preaching Conference? This week, I can promise you they have. You, you don't think there's, there's a devil uh, just watching Verity Baptist Church? You don't think there's a devil just watching Faithful Word Baptist Church? You don't think there's a devil, you know, all, all these churches, old paths, all these churches represented at this conference, that fact. You don't think there's a devil uh, uh, watching Liberty Baptist Church that has just focused in. Look, here he says, these false prophets, I don't know anything about you. But the devil said, I know Jesus and I know Paul. You say, Why? Because Paul was causing an uproar. Paul, Paul was, was, was uh, rocking the boat a little bit. Notice there's this spiritual application. There's a spiritual opposition. He says, Jesus I know and Paul I know. But notice, not only is there a spiritual opposition, but there's also a stirring of the people. Notice verse 8. Please understand this. Some of you need to just get this. Acts 19, verse 8, And he went to the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Verse 9, But when divers were hardened and believed not, you realize not everybody's going to get saved, right? But spake evil of that way before the multitude. Realize that sometimes there will be those who oppose the things of God, who oppose soul winning. They believed not, and they spake evil of that way before the multitude. Look at verse 23. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Here we have a man who makes idols for a living. And now Paul is taking people out of that false religion. And this is how he makes his living. And by the way, he made a good living. He brought no small gain. Notice verse 25. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, this guy has a problem with Paul. He said, sirs, you know, that by the craft, by this craft, we have our wealth. Right, right next to that verse, you can put the love of money as the root of all evil. They said, by this craft, we have our wealth. Moreover, you see it here that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also, it's an afterthought, that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. Notice, look, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. This guy is concerned with his wallet. This, you say, Pastor Jimenez, why do the false prophets just hate the new IFB movement? You know why? Because we're affecting their paycheck. You know why they hate us? You know why they can't stand us? Because you're not buying their stupid DVDs anymore. You're not going to their stupid Christian bookstore anymore. You're not going to their church uh, that has a bookstore in the floor, which is unbiblical anyway. You know, that's why they're mad at us. That's why they hate us. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. And they're saying, hey, our craft is in danger. But it's also because we love Diana. Afterthought. And notice what he said. Diana should be despised and her magnific uh, uh, ma magnificence should be destroyed. And all Asia and the world worship it. Verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Notice verse 29. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the, uh, unto the people, the disciples suffered. The word suffered there means allowed, allowed him not. 
And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, said unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not whereof. That means for what reason they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude. The Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with his hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, We are Orlando. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm having great. I'm having flashbacks. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. People say, Pastor Jimenez, aren't you embarrassed that there was this huge protest against your church? You know, we had a big uproar here. We had uh, uh, the, the news reports that there was 1,500 protesters outside of our church. Whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure who counted. The, the police department, Sacramento Police Department, told me there was 200 law enforcement personnel that were there to make sure that these stinking, filthy reprobates didn't kill us. You say, Pastor Jimenez, aren't you? I mean, isn't that kind of, because people act like, isn't that something that you're kind of embarrassed about? Isn't that something you kind of have to explain away? You know, we only have to explain it away because Christians today don't know their Bibles. There's no new thing under the sun. We're living New Testament Christianity. People say, hey, your church got protested. There must be something wrong with your church. Well, then there must have been something wrong with Paul's ministry because he got protested too. You say the Massa Conference got protested. The media was going crazy and talking ill against the Massa Conference, and there was a, a protest at Revival Baptist Church. Then they must have been doing something right, because that's what happened in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Amen. Revival Baptist Church got protested. Faith Forward Baptist Church been protested several times. All Scripture Baptist Church got protested. Steadfast Baptist Church got protested. Mount Baptist Church got protested. You say, is there something wrong with that? There's something very right with that. Amen. Welcome to New Testament Christianity. Because here we have this huge protest for the space of two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Look, look, if the world loves you, you're doing something wrong. If you're never, if you're never coming head to head with Satan, if you're never coming at odds with Satan, you must be running in the same direction. Because when you try to swim upstream, when you try to cause an uproar, when you try to cause a ruckus, when you try to cause some issues, hey, somebody is going to get upset. Somebody said to me yesterday, they were out soul winning. They said, I went out soul winning. Somebody started yelling at me. They saw your picture on the invitation. They started yelling at me, saying, ah, guys, I hate preacher, blah, blah. You know, sometimes when that conversation goes, you're kind of trying to gauge the individual. And sometimes you have to say, hey, man, I'm sorry you got yelled at, but... Uh, you know, the world doesn't like our stand. Before I started that, they were like, yeah, that's great. Amen. I didn't realize how famous you were in Sacramento. I'm like, I'm not sure famous is the right word. Maybe infamous, but. They were saying, I can't wait till my pastor. I start getting yelled at because of my pastor back home. <laughs> hey, I'm just telling you, this is New Testament Christianity. If, if, if you're going to stir things up a little bit, if you're going to cause an uproar a little bit, if you're going to accomplish something for God a little bit, you might have to suffer just a little persecution. Look, no one died. We're supposed to be willing to die for the cause of Christ. And, and you say, well, well, I'm afraid I might lose my job. Look, you, if we're going to make an impact for Christ, we have to be willing to suffer. Yea, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And if you're not suffering persecution, that is a promise from God's word. If you're not suffering persecution, then you must not be living godly. Because they hated Christ. And if they hated our Lord and Savior, our Master, why would they love us? Right. Say, why, why do you guys preach against Billy Graham? Because, you know, there's just something wrong with Billy Graham, who was, who was supposed to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's just loved by the world. There's something wrong with that. The Bible tells us, that's, you, you say, how do you know a false prophet? When the world loves him, false prophet. Amen. Joel Osteen, false prophet. Amen. Billy Graham, false prophet. Amen. Any, any other preacher out there that the world loves? False prophet! Amen. 
You say, how, how do you, how, Pastor Jimenez, can you just give me a quick way? Sometimes, you know, I'm running into uh, preachers or sermons on YouTube. Can you get me, get me a quick way or I'm trying to look for a church in the area? How do I find the best church in the area? Read their Google reviews. Oh, if they've got five stars. No, no, no. <laughs> if they've got about 700 reviews that say, hateful, angry, <laughs> ugly. He's good looking, but I don't like his preaching. Uh, I, think, uh, I, think, I think that's one of them. <laughs> if you've got a one star review, <laughs> hey, you say, how do I know if a church is good? The less stars, the better. Because look, if the world, lo if the world loves you, there's something wrong with you. If the world loves you, there's something wrong with you. You say, yeah, but all this media attention, you know, all the, all the news, Pastor Grace and Fritz. By the way, we stand with Pastor Grace and Fritz. Yeah. Praise God for a man of God. Hey, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, it's great that uh, as far as losing his job, you know, and he's going to have rewards in heaven. I, I'm just sad that they, that they took a man out of law enforcement that actually knew what the reprobate doctrine was. Yeah. And actually could identify a psychopath reprobate that would hurt people. You say, oh, Grace and Fritz was all over the news, and you've been on the news, and Pastor Andy said, you know, this is, a, this is a bad mark for Christianity. Aren't you, aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid of all this negative media attention? Aren't you afraid? Look, when it comes to Christianity, there's, there's no such thing as negative publicity. Amen. Let the Word of God be published. Amen. Hey, let me let you in on a little secret. This week, the Red Hot Preaching Conference. There's been a journalist from the L.A. Times with us the entire week. My wife went soul winning with her yesterday. Nice lady. You know, I, I hope she gives a fair and balanced uh, view of, of, of our church and our movement. Say, pa 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 Pastor Jimenez, aren't you afraid, though? Because the media's, not, the media's taken you out of context before. The media's not been nice to you before. Aren't you, aren't you afraid they're going to make you look bad? A aren't, you a aren't you afraid they're going to they're gonna take you out of context? Aren't you afraid they're going to say things about you? Are you know, your wife went so and Aren't you afraid you're going to say something? So, you know, I hope that doesn't happen. I, I, I hope we get a, a, a fair shake at this thing. But you know what? Even if they do, the word of God is magnified. Amen. Yeah. Well, aren't you afraid? Afraid of what? Aren't you afraid they're going to get on the LA Times? There's going to be an article saying that you hate queers? Fine with that? Amen. You're like, man, you're known as the preacher that hates sodomy and preach. Look, if I go down in history as the hardest preacher against homos, praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, I, Paul, Paul's going to have all these great stories. I'll be like, hey, you know what? They said, Romans 1, I was your champion, man. <laughs> I, I championed Romans 1 for you. You know, aren't you afraid they're going to take you out? Of, look, aren't you afraid they're going to say something? Aren't you afraid that they're going to stand up and say, well, Verity Baptist Church thinks that Leviticus 20 and 13 ought to be the law of land. Hey, newsflash, we do think that. Amen. Aren't you afraid that they're going to say, well, Pastor Jimenez believes that if a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Newsflash, we do believe that. Amen. Say, well, what if they put a clip of that all over the news? Then the word of God will be magnified. Amen. Acts 19, 17, notice what the Bible says. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Acts 19, verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You say, back in 2016 with that whole thing and you were in the news. You say, well, was that a mistake? Was that a setback? Did that hurt you? You know what? Probably more people read Leviticus 2013 and Romans chapter 1 in the United States of America in that week and in the weeks coming to it than had ever read it before. Right. And the word of God grew and was magnified. Amen. And the Lord was magnified. <coughs> Aren't you afraid they're going to take you out of I like it even when they take us out of context. I like it. I, when, when they, when, aren't, but what if they lie about you? What if they say you're not nice and you're mean and you're, look, whatever. I, I'm not here to build up my reputation. We are here to cause an uproar. We are here to turn the tide. We are here to cause a ruckus Amen. to challenge the status quo. 
to disturb, disturb the balance, to make us think. Maybe that should have been the title of the sermon. <laughs> I probably would have got a lot of clicks. <laughs> to rock the boat, to upset the apple cart, to stir things up a little bit. You say, Pastor Jimenez, why would you start the Red Hot Preaching Conference? What's the point of this? What's the point of, of 418 people coming out here, whatever the number was? We, you understand we have people here from Romania, Malaysia, Australia, Canada, South Korea, Japan. We, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't take a census, but we have people here from probably most of the states in the United States of America, if not every state in the United States of America, but maybe some of the smaller ones. I mean, we have people here from, from all, all over the place. You say, why would you do this? Isn't this expensive? Isn't this time-consuming? Doesn't this take a lot of time? Here's, here's why we do this. Because I'm hoping we'll just set a little fire in you. I'm, hope, I'm hoping some of you will go back home and say, hey, let's, let's make an uproar. Let, let, let's, let's walk into emph emphasis being a, a God-hating, Diana-worshipping culture, and let's walk out with an uproar. Let's walk out with a protest. Let's walk out, at the, whether they get saved or not saved, at least let's make sure they know that a prophet has been among them. Amen. Amen. Let's cause an uproar. Let's cause an uproar. It's not a bad thing. New Testament Christianity went from city to city to city, shaking things up. Why? Because things need to be shaken up. Amen. And what to God, what to God, that they would say? What to God, that somebody in Fresno, when we start soul winning out there and we start uh, building that church up there, that somebody in Fresno would say, these that have turned Sacramento upside down are come hither also. <laughs> and what to God, they say that of your town, in your city, in every city Amen. in America today. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for these principles, these stories you've given us as an example. And Lord, help us not to be afraid. Let's make some waves. Let's cause an uproar. Let's make an impact for the cause of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help our church here, Verity Baptist Church, just be focused on what you've called us to do. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would just light a fire in some churches today. So some church members would go home from this conference and just get behind their pastor. Say, let's do something big. Let's go big or go home. Lord, I pray there'd be some young men in this room right now. That years from now, we would glory in the fact that they'll be able to look back at the Red Hot Preaching Conference 2019 and say, that's the day, that's the week when God worked in my heart, when I decided, forget business, forget the world, I'm going to go conquer a city for Christ. And Lord, we give you the honor and glory and praise for it. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.